Ooh, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Savage at Prop Store down in Los Angeles, demonstrating trigger discipline even with fictional weapons. Yes, I'm standing here with Chuck, and we're talking about your auction that's coming up in March. That is. It's coming up March uh, 12th through the 14th. You have 1,700 items that are going up for auction. I singled out this one as one I wanted to talk about because I know a lot about this. Tell me about what this is from. This is from the very first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. This is obviously Star-Lord's, uh, I guess, famous gun. It's his, it's his right-hand <laughs> sidearm. Yeah, exactly. And you'll, you can notice the grip is actually yep. different for the two sides of the guns or the two different guns. Uh, but this was, uh, it was actually seen, believe it or not, at 2013 San Diego Comic-Con. Really? And there are people that took pictures of this very gun that we were able to match to, which oh. was very cool. Supposedly, I guess, when they were doing Comic-Con, the movie was still in production. They borrowed it off set to give a bit of a preview for wow. it. And then sent it back to production. Uh, and then ultimately is now in your hands. I, I don't know which shop built these guns, but it is some beautiful construction. I see several techniques going on here. Yeah. Uh, among them, molding and casting, obviously uh, some lovely fake carbon fiber covering on the handle yes, here. Yes, yes, shines um, nicely. The metal here, which I did with aluminum plumbing tape, it yeah. looks like they actually plated these parts. It, it does, it, it's got that heavier feel to it as well, mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, this all seems custom machined. Yeah, and that, this looks, almost looks airbrushed effect that they did on top of the metal. That is a totally, I love the burnt metal painting <laughs> technique. This was my favorite part of making my Star-Lord guns because that is, when you get that right, it's really, really Yeah, fun. I like the, the way that it goes from blue to pink and, mm -hmm. and, and you've got that. It was really hot at one point on the tip, yeah. It is, it is, like I said, it is one of the holy grail challenges for painting to get it to look correct. I did it once on the Ambon rifle from Mandalorian and then twice on these guys. It is, this is one of those props that the closer you look at it, the more it delivers. Yeah, and it's got a good good weight, good feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, and unlike some of the resin versions of this, this actually feels, it, it definitely looks like a hero. And I've seen the, seen the other ones. This is the only one I've seen that's been sort of this hero type build. I, I totally agree. And the, the, the custom machining they've done here, and this looks like they've done some careful laser cut plastic or aluminum here. They really lend a lot of scale to it, a lot of like intricate detail that even though you don't see it in the film, it still communicates. Yeah, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah, and, you know, Guardians, when I first saw it, I hadn't heard of the Guardians, you know, for, as a comic book. Yeah, was, I never read them in the comic books. I, I read them, they were in this Marvel Presents, but it didn't have all the characters in it. And I thought bringing it together and putting Star-Lord front and center and having weapons like this and his, his famous mask and yes. just his outfit, it made that first impression. I was like, actually, you know, I could get into Guardians. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, it's oh, not they've bad. got. So it looks like they've got practical lights up front for a lighting effect. For I think firing. it did. I think mm -hmm, it, I think mm -hmm. they did some research and it did work at one point in time. I'm not sure it does now, but. Oh yeah, though. So I see some ports there. Definitely was the ability to put electronics in here. That is, I love seeing this up close. I spent weeks on this, putting this in my head to understand it. If we can only find the other one that matches on, on right, the other side. Right, it's part of a set that other, it's made of somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere okay. it's out there. All right, Chuck, the next piece that's assembled here I wanted to talk about was the Iron Man armor. Yes, from Age of Ultron. The that's Avengers what this movie. is, okay, yes. took me a minute. Yeah, so, so it was the uh, Iron Legion that are called in to sort of clear <clears throat> out Sokovia right before uh, they expect some, some bad things to happen. And yeah. This is production made. This is. This is was actually it was a <laughs> background piece so that you do see the the Iron Legion or the main the, the number five I believe actually comes and is is front and center on this one. Yeah. But this looks like a more like an Iron Man sort of design with totally a circular por portion of this. Um, but I always thought that this was a CG effect until I actually saw this practical yeah. uh, one that was that, that we ended up with here. So it's it's a fantastic piece. Looks very much like an Iron Man type costume. I assume it may have been built by the same people, but um, well, take a look. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I, one, <laughs> because I heard that uh, Robert Downey Jr. was unhappy with the first Iron Man suit, that he got armor bites, and every cosplayer who wears any kind of armor knows the pain of those pinches between stuff. Uh, and I've always, I have never seen a piece of Iron Man, real production made Iron Man armor up close. So I've always been fascinated to understand how flexible it actually was. And I'm really impressed with how lightweight and comfortable this looks like it might be to wear. It does. The, and the other thing about Iron Man, especially the Iron Man costumes themselves, I always understood talking to Legacy, 
Secret, they didn't actually build full Iron Man costumes for a lot of the shots. Yes. They were always like portions of the Iron Man costume. So again, great to see the full top part here, front and back, because yes. a lot of times they would sort of save by not actually building the back of the costume. It's crazy how much dimensionality they get out of stuff that is really specifically soft rubber. Yeah. Can, can we pull this yeah, off please, the mannequin? Please, please. Really? Yes, yes. Oh, oh. Show everybody. Oh. <laughs> Nice oh. and lightweight. You actually, as an actor, yeah, that maybe wouldn't kill this you. maybe weighs about. Ooh, oh, I see. It's it's plugged in there, so we got the lighting effect in there. This but. maybe weighs about seven pounds. It's not much at all. It's very well iron legion chest copy. I see that L one. L one. It's got a lot of markings on the inside from mm -hmm. production, showing yep, what it yep. is. Yep. Um, and they've done a tremendous amount of work to pad it for the actor wearing it. Um, and the whole thing feels like it's made of uh, a kind of, not a flexible plastic, but like a hard rubber. Yeah. And, but painted and it's got the full finish on that one. Yeah, too. no, I mean, you've got these metallic effects. Yep. That's incredible. Yeah. I even see a paint trip here and there that is, doesn't <laughs> need to be removed. I, I gotta say, actually as an Iron Man cosplayer, it's delightful to see this up close. The detail, yeah. Uh, get some good picture of this for my reference. Um, <laughs> This is this is something you never get to see the inside uh, of. That's what prop store is good for, right? Oh man, I just like I'm so. Oh, um, I do believe this was legacy effects. I, I, I would these. imagine, yes. Yeah, so legacy did build the Iron Man armor. It makes sense that they would build uh, the Iron Legion armor as well. What um, I what I've heard from the inside is that at the very moment they finally made a comfortable to wear Iron Man suit, Robert Downey Jr. was like, "I am never wearing an Iron Man suit again." <laughs> Which I get, right? Like, a, these are hard costumes to wear, but oh my God, I can't believe how solid and metallic and mechanical it looks despite being lightweight and um, easy to wear. You're gonna have to help me get this sure. back on here. Yeah, and we also noticed, I think taking a look at this, even the Avengers logo that was on here was uh, was stenciled on, which yes. was interesting in that they could have just put a decal on there. Or Right, it is not dimensional vinyl. That is clearly they made a frisket and they painted and then peeled the frisket back. Yeah, neat piece. That is a really lovely piece. Uh, is this the only Iron Man piece you've got up in the auction? Uh, for now, I believe it is for this auction. Um, we've had some Iron Man pieces are in the past, but honestly, this is one of the best standalone pieces because you've got the, the yeah. center light in there as well. So I think it, it's, it's just the right amount of Iron Man uh, if you're looking for something to put in your collection. I do see a little bit of paint deterioration. It's hard to stick uh, to, you know, paint onto it's flexible It's been over surfaces. 10 years on a lot of these movies, so I know. Yeah. Uh, next to it, we've got another superhero. Yes, one of my favorite, uh, well, this is what for me kicked off the Marvel Universe, although it was the Fox Universe at the time, was from the very first X-Men movie. This Wolverine. is the first X-Men movie. The first one, one of my favorites. Dude, um, I, I wholly agree. This is my favorite Logan, except for the movie Logan. Yes, yes. And, and what I loved about it, again, you know, I grew up in the 80s. Um, Wolverine's had different costumes over the years. Mm -hmm. He's got the yellow and, and blue costume. But at the time, in the 80s, he was in his brown and, and tan costume. Yeah. And I think what made this work, even though it was real world clothes, is the fact that they incorporated those elements. There's sort of the stripes that were on on the sides of his superhero yes. costume that are at the bottom now of this. Yeah. You've got three of these, which was also the number that he had on, on the side of the costume. And when you think of classic X-Men comic books, you know, Wolverine actually did wear a leather jacket in, in X-Men 141, which is the famous Days of Future Past. So for <laughs> X-Men fans, when this came about, even though they weren't wearing the superhero costumes, it hit comic book fans as like, this is right. And yeah. Hugh Jackman was the right actor to portray Wolverine. I agree 100%. I loved when I came in, I was asking, hey, is that missing stripe canon? We looked it up, it certainly was. It was missing that stripe It is, in from production. the beginning of the movie through the end. Uh, he gets thrown through uh, the, the glass, uh, I guess the the, uh, the truck that he's, he's driving with Rogue. And even on the back, there's some damage to this, uh, which I assume was supposed to be from that scene as well. Yeah. But really, you know, it sort of talks to the history of the character. This guy's been around forever, even his jacket. He hasn't changed this in 50 right, years. Right. Things are falling off of his jacket. It just that adds to the character because in the comics, he, he how old was Wolverine? I don't know, like 100 uh, a couple something? Hundred, yeah, 150 yeah. years old, Civil know. War. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't a young man. Um, and the shirt is also from the it same is. costume. It is, yeah. Wow, it looks great. I mean, it looks beat up, but like <laughs> appropriately so. That's right, and, uh, and it's, a, you know, I think noticing this, this was obviously added on top of a leather jacket, but 
it adds its own uh, sort of, uh, I guess, nuance to it. It's it's very rough cut. It is super rough cut. I want to point this out to Wolverine cosplayers: is that these stripes are clearly added after the jacket was made. Uh, you can see the sort of raw leather edge across the top of all of the leather. So it's uh, everyone get less precious about how clean your Wolverine <laughs> costumes are. Um, and we've got some claws. Yes, so the claws, obviously they started in X1. These are from uh, X-Men Origin Wolverine. Oh. And you know they did change the design of the claws. When they, they first started in X-Men 1, they had sort of a, um, the, uh, the, these were, were round. These were rounded, but what they found is that all the different claws were actually rotating and they weren't staying in one place. So they went with square. They went with square ah. in X-Men 1 and that's the, the design that stayed through the X-Men movies is they kept that because it, it held the shape better. I I love these claws. Yeah. I love this effect of them coming around the back of your uh, back of your hands. It, it really sells it, if you're not wearing white cotton gloves. It worked, <laughs> but what I've seen on some of them is that they would they would move a lot and they'd actually crack off these oh. pieces because these are made out of resin. Yeah, uh, and so you'd see a lot of broken ones. And the story was that on set, I think even for X, especially for X Men One, there was like a, a trash can, and they would throw these into a bucket as soon as they get, they went through them because they were they were using up multiples because they right. got damaged so many times. <gasps> So it's, like it's great to see. Full of Wolverine That's claws. the rumor. That is what I've heard from people that have worked on the set. So I, I wish I was there that day. Um, but these are a great set. And the design has pretty much stayed similar. I think you've seen different ones that might have um, I think rubber on the end. I think there's a recent Wolverine claw set that is slightly different grip and the blades are a different uh, topography. Yeah. But also it's, they've painted these flesh so that they hopefully disappear more. Yeah, and I think you always see on different ones, oh, you see this that. is right, left, left and right, yes. yep, so that you know which hand it's supposed to be in, because I think they've they've adjusted it so that it, it, it fits the actor's hand Fair. and doesn't crack like I was talking about if they, they flex their knuckles too much. And they, a lot of times they would polish it right down here. You can always tell the finished ones from the unfinished ones because I think there was, uh, you would see it sort of come out of the mold and they'd have to polish all these down paint these so that they were screen and camera ready. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, we have one more superhero to cover in this beautiful batch. All right, tell me about this beautiful piece. So this is by artist David Mack. Um, don't know if you know David Mack. David's probably best known for his painted artwork that was done for the Jessica Jones series. So the intro uh, sequence for Jessica Jones was illustrated by David Mack. Holy and David cow, Mack, I love David Mack's illustrations. It, it was great. I think he actually won an award for that opening sequence with, with Jessica Jones. Yeah. But you'll notice this is a very different style than what you saw in Jessica Jones. Yeah. And my understanding is that he actually pitched this is for uh, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, second Captain America movie. And they were doing the end credit sequence yeah. and he pitched Marvel the idea. He said, look, I can do this. This is what it should look like. And he came up with this style, which was very much in shadow. Um, and it's very much an homage to Jim Steranko, who if, you know, for folks that were friends of, or, or fans of Indiana Jones, he did for Raiders of the Lost Ark, he did some of the, uh, the great paintings for that. But Jim Steranko, very famous graphic artist, known for Nick Fury and some of the other comics that he drew as well. But that's more the, the heavily shadowed, very graphic style was what this, what this uh, what, you know, what he ended up doing here. Amazing. And this was the Captain America. There's, a, we have another one that's the Winter Soldier from this. These weren't the final designs. They actually had to change things like the, the costume design changed as they were evolving the oh, movie. Wow. So this is a later stage, you know, drawing that he did. And then they animated it. And so when you see the final sequence, it took David's drawings, but there was an, uh, an animator that actually put that all together into one big animated sequence. But it, David's drawings were used for this. And I think it's just amazing to see it. Now the final version was black, it was pure black and white. Yeah. Not, you didn't have this red, I think the they experimented strange. with some of the, some colors on it. But it's just amazing, you know, nice standalone artwork that you could put up at home, but it is from a movie. It really is gorgeous, signed by the artist. I mean, it is, it's really neat when you can see the the, the close-up pen work and slight amount of like over crossing over the lines and stuff like that, but that sells this story so well. It is, and it feels very much like you're sitting there at like the Lincoln Memorial with the columns yeah. right there and Captain America shining through. I, I just love this piece. Um, That's and, and it's it's the, for a comic book fan and for a movie fan. hundred percent. That it is a super comic over book. perfectly. You know. I, Chuck, this is a great quartet of superheroes, <laughs> uh, superhero ephemera we have here. Thank wow, you so I'm much. I'm glad I could share them with you. Really appreciate it.
I can't thank you enough for supporting us by watching the channel. If you've been to our merch store, you might want to head there again because we are always updating our roster with new products. Here is the anime-inspired Tested logo in Japanese, my, one of my all-time favorite new designs. Uh, we're also selling Tested mugs and Tested hats. Oh, and if you want a cup of tea, we're selling that too. Tested-store.com. Tested-store.com. <laughs>